Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How is everyone tonight? That's it? Come on. I want to start on September 29th, 2006. Petty Officer Michael Monsor is a United States Navy SEAL operating in Ramadi, Iraq. He's on a roof in Ramadi, and he's standing in front of a doorway to this roof. He has two Navy SEAL colleagues with him. They're in this sniper-prone position. They've already taken attacks from AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade but they don't know where the enemy is at the present time. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's somebody on the loudspeaker in the town mosque saying, kill the Americans! As Mansour and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade on the roof. It hits Mansour in the chest, and it falls to his feet. He has a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two Navy SEAL colleagues laying on the roof will surely die. Monsoor yells, Grenade! But instead of jumping backward through the doorway, he jumps forward, chest first, onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Monsoor dies. His two Navy SEAL colleagues only received minor injuries because Monsoor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors said at the funeral, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, You will not take my friends. I will go in their stead. I've never seen a United States president cry until March 31st, 2008. That's when President George W. Bush called Monsoor's parents into the East Room of the White House to give them Monsoor's Medal of Honor posthumously. The president couldn't even get through the citation without breaking down. Since then, Monsoor's High School in Garden Grove, California, built a new stadium. They named it Michael Monsoor Memorial Stadium. The trident that the seals wear dominates the 50-yard line. Just four weeks ago, Saturday, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsoor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet. This is Monsoor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship, named in honor of her son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsoor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. There's no greater love than that. He sacrificed himself for his friends. The question is, would anybody sacrifice himself to save you? The answer is, someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But many people in our culture today don't think the story's true. They think it's invented. They think it's made up. After all, it's got miracles in it. We don't believe in miracles anymore. It's got a resurrection. How many people have you seen resurrected? I haven't seen anybody resurrected. How can you believe in such a thing? And by the way, this was written down by religious people, and we know religious people embellish things, so how can you believe it? Well, I actually think the story's true. I think somebody actually did die for you and died for me. And you can show it's true by simply answering four questions. In other words, if you investigate these four questions, I think you'll realize that the answer to these four questions is yes, and if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity's true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions.
Now that is some pretty grooving music, isn't it? Yeah. That is actually from our TV show, which is on tonight, every Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. if you have direct TV. If you don't have direct TV, it's on Roku. Anyone here have Roku? You guys know what Roku is? It's on the National Religious Broadcasters, NRB channel on Roku. If you don't have direct TV and you don't have Roku, it's on this new technology sweeping Lexington right now. It's called the Internet. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually broadcast on our website, crossexamine.org, at these times tonight. Uh, and it's also on our app, which I'll tell you about later. We're on radio every Saturday morning. It's on 186 stations around the country. But you can listen to that anytime you want because it's on iTunes. It's podcasted. It's on our app. And what we do is we present evidence for Christianity and we cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. And by the way, this is going to be the outline that we're going to go through tonight. Why are these the four questions? Does truth exist? Well, you hear people today saying, well, there's no truth, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. Well, look, if there's no truth, Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there's no truth, then atheism can't be true either, right? So we're going to deal with that question first. Second question, does God exist? Obviously, Christianity can't be true if there's no God. But I hope to show you tonight, through three arguments, that there really is a theistic God. What's a theistic God? That's a spaceless timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things to this very moment. As I say, we're going to look at three arguments very briefly. We don't have a lot of time to get into them, but we'll look at them. Third question is, are miracles possible? Obviously, Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible, and a lot of people today don't think they're possible. But I hope to show you tonight that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and even atheists are agreeing with the data for this miracle. Then we're going to get to the key question, is the New Testament true? Particularly with regard, with, with regard to the resurrection. Now, the New Testament doesn't have a prayer if there's no truth, no God, or no miracles. But if truth exists, if God exists, if miracles are possible, then we can see if the central miracle in the New Testament actually occurred, and that, of course, is the, the resurrection. If Jesus really rose from the dead, game over, Christianity's true. Of course, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then game over, it's not true. You might as well sleep in on Sunday and do what you want the rest of the week. I'm paraphrasing the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 15, right? Your faith's in vain if he didn't rise from the dead. Now, some of you are looking at that going, wait a minute, Frank, time out. What about the Old Testament? Do you believe, believe the Old Testament's true? Well, look, if the New Testament's reliable, you get the Old Testament thrown in. Why? Who's in the New Testament that can authenticate the Old Testament? Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're ever in Sunday school, you don't know the answer, just say Jesus, you'll probably be right. <laughs> Pastor, it's Jesus. Yes, that's right. Look, if Jesus really is God, as the New Testament documents claim he is, now that's a big if, but if he really is God, whatever God teaches is true. Jesus taught the entire Old Testament as the word of God, so if the New Testament's reliable, you get the Old Testament thrown in. Now, there's a lot more detail than we can cover here. Uh, if you want to go deeper, we have some books over there. We've got a 12-part DVD series that goes through all this in great detail. Uh, there's also a new book over there called Stealing from God and Christians. This book, Stealing from God, is not about tithing, all right? The subtitle is Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. I've noticed that when atheists are arguing there is no God, they actually have to steal aspects of reality that would only exist if God existed in order to say he doesn't exist. In effect, they have to sit in God's lap to slap his face. Now, we're going to go through this at blazing speed. Um, now, I'm originally from New Jersey, okay, which means you cannot listen in Southern, all right? Because I'm going I'm to move, move along just like Pastor Mike does. Now, you're not going to be able to keep up. So if you want this PowerPoint presentation, in fact, I can't show you the whole thing. If you want the whole thing, just text the word evidence to 44222. Evidence to 44222 will send you the PDF of this PowerPoint presentation, plus the first chapter, Stealing from God, and some other stuff. We're not going to give your email address to anybody else, all right? All right. Are you guys ready to go? All right. We're going to start here at point one, does truth exist? Now... Whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, yeah. 
Calvary Chapel, Lexington, that was weak. If he said it that way, the movie would have gone nowhere. You can't handle the truth. How did he say it? Here's how he said it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, let's try that again. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Much better, much better. Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth. I got my truth. There is no truth. All truth is relative. You've heard all these claims, right? Well, if you don't get anything outside of what we talk about here tonight, this is certainly the most important thinking skill that, you'll, that we'll, we'll talk about tonight. In fact, it's the most important thinking skill I've ever learned. In fact, I already had a master's degree. I was 33 years old, and I didn't even know this to show you how dim-witted I was. But once you get your mind around this thinking skill, half of what you need to know to avoid error and defend the Christian faith, you'll already know. And it's so simple. And the easiest way of demonstrating it to you is just to show you an example of using it. Suppose someone ever were to come up to you and say something like this, there is no truth. What would you say to that person? Yeah, if somebody says there is no truth, you're going to say, hey, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. Did I say that right? This is known as a self-defeating statement. What's a self-defeating statement? A self-defeating statement violates the law of non-contradiction. It's just one of the fundamental laws of all thought. A self-defeating statement doesn't meet its own standard. It would be like me saying I can't speak a word in English. What would you say? Yeah, you just used English to say it. Or it would be like saying my parents had no kids that lived. Right? I mean, you'd have to exist to say that, right? These are self-defeating statements. And once you get good at identifying self-defeating statements, half of what you need to know, you'll already know. Because half the battle is just avoiding what is false. And this will help you avoid things that are false. There's a lot of false statements made in our society. This is one of them. And here's the tactic, or here's the thinking skill. What you want to do is you want to turn the claim on itself. Turn the claim on itself. So if somebody says there's no truth, you say, is that true? All right, let's do just a couple more of these. Uh, how about somebody says all truth is relative? If you turn the claim on itself, what are you going to say to them? Is that a relative truth? No, that's an absolute truth. How about if somebody says there are no absolutes? Yeah, you're going to say, is that an absolute truth? Yeah, it is in that. Or you could say, you're absolutely sure. You could say it that way, right? How about if somebody says you can't know anything? Then how do you know that you can't know? Right? You can see this is self-defeating. How about if somebody says, it's true for you, but not for me? That's one of my favorites. Oh, Christianity's true for, for you, but Buddhism's true for me. What do you say to that? If somebody says, it's true for you, but not for me, turn the claim on itself and say, is that true for everybody? Is true for you, but not for me, true for everybody? Because if true for you, but not for me, is true for everybody, then true for you, but not for me, can't be true, because it's true for everybody. Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. But that's because it's self-defeating. It's like saying, I can't speak a word in English. Actually, there's a more fun way of dealing with this. Um, say, sure, go try that with a police officer. Let's suppose you're going... Uh, 100 miles an hour down Highway 20 out here. Cop pulls you over, walks up to your car, knocks on the glass, you put the window down, he says, you're going 100. It's easy to get out of a ticket. You simply say, ha, that's true for you, but not for me. And you speed away. <laughs> Can't give you a ticket if it's not true for you. No, if it's true you were going 100, that's true for all people at all times, in all places, regardless of what anybody believes about it. By the way, I go to a lot of churches. I normally ask people, do you think Christianity is true? And most people will say yes, and they'll say, why do you think it's true? You know what answer I get more than any other? Because I have faith. Is that a good answer? Does your faith change whether or not Christianity is true? No. I mean, do you have to believe something to make it true? Do you have to believe in gravity to stay on the ground? Do people who don't believe in gravity float away? Hey, look, there's another one. Hey, if you believe, you'll come back. No, that's not the way it works. You say, why is the Bible always talking about faith then? Because there's two kinds of faith. There's belief that, and then there's belief in. Belief that is getting evidence that God exists, that Jesus rose from the dead, that the Bible is telling the truth. All that is dealing with evidence. That's why we call this apologetics. doesn't mean we're saying we're sorry. It comes from the Greek word, which means to defend, to give evidence. But all the belief that in the world... 
won't get your moral transgressions forgiven. You have to go from belief that to belief in. And there's a difference. Look, James, the half-brother of Jesus who wrote that little book in the New Testament called James. You guys are smart. Well, at Calvary Chapel, you guys go through the, the Bible verse by verse. So you know about James, right? James says, even the demons believe that God exists, but they tremble. Do you know that the demons know that God exists better than we do? But they don't trust in him. Why? They don't want to trust in him. They haven't gone from belief that to belief in. And if you want to get your moral transgressions forgiven, you have to go from belief that to belief in. And we know belief that and belief in in human relationships, right? When I first met my wife 33 years ago, I got evidence that she would be a good wife, but all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife. I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. <laughs> See, that's the difference between belief that and belief in. Most of the time, the Bible, when it's talking about faith, it's talking about the second kind, belief in. After you know that it's true, trust in it. Just like you're trusting in the chair you're sitting in right now. You're not even thinking about it, but you're trusting in it. When you sat down, you trusted that thing would hold you up, right? You went from belief that to belief in by sitting down. When you get on a plane, you do the same thing. You go from belief that to belief in. You're trusting that the plane is maintained right, the pilots are trained, the air traffic controllers are trained, right? You're going from belief that to belief in. So your faith doesn't change a thing about whether or not Christianity is true, but your faith, really your trust, is a way that you're demonstrating that you want to be saved by Christ. That's the difference between belief that and belief in. How about the claim... You should doubt everything. If you turn the claim on itself, what should you say to him? Should I doubt that? I mean, why are skeptics skeptical of everything but skepticism? You notice how they don't doubt that? They think it's true. How about this one? You hear this a lot. You ought not judge. Yeah, someone says you ought not judge. You turn the claim on itself and you say, then why are you judging me for judging? He said, wait a minute, Frank, time out. Didn't Jesus say don't judge? No, he didn't. He didn't say don't judge and just stop there. You see, skeptics and atheists, they just memorize one verse. In fact, what I'm going to say now may sound crazy, but it's true. There are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. The verse numbers were put in there about 500 years ago to help us navigate the text. That's a good thing. What's the problem with it? We tend to think we can take little verses out of context and make them say whatever we want. No. Look at the whole passage where Jesus says, judge not, Matthew 7, 1. What does he say? Judge not, lest you be judged. By the same standard you judge others, you'll be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the log out of your own eye first, then you'll be better able to help your brother. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? No, he's actually telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He's simply saying, get that problem out of your life first so you can then go better help your brother. So this is not a command not to judge. It's actually a command on how to judge. In other words, don't judge hypocritically. If you've got that problem, fix it, then go help your brother. But it would be completely ridiculous to say don't make judgments. Why? Number one, it's a judgment itself. Number two, you wouldn't be alive very long if you didn't make judgments. You made a hundred judgments just getting over here tonight, right? Good choices from bad choices, safe choices from dangerous choices. And by the way, everybody makes judgments. Atheists make judgments. What judgments do they make? Well, there's no God. The Bible's wrong. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. There are no objective moral values. These are all judgments. The question isn't whether or not you can make judgments. The question is, are your judgments true? I will say this, though, about Jesus and judging he did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental. And who were the judgmental ones in his day? The Pharisees. And who were the Pharisees? What was their job? What did they do? They were the religious and political leaders of Israel. They helped run Israel. Some of them were on the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. Are you telling me Jesus got involved in politics? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. He went after the politicians. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What happens in John chapter 2? Jesus takes a whip and jacks people up in the temple. 
sweet and gentle Jesus? Yes! And then in John chapter 8, he's talking to these Pharisees, these religious and political leaders, and he gets to the point in the conversation where he says, your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Excuse me, I am Christ. And then in Matthew 23, to these same people, what does he say? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you brood of vipers, you snakes. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside. You're whitewashed tombs. But on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, and then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? Sweet and gentle Jesus said this? Yes, Jesus was not Barney. <laughs> Can't we all get along, boys and girls? No! I came to bring a sword. It's going to divide mother and daughter, father and son. He was not Mr. Rogers. Can you say kindness, boys and girls? I mean, he was kind most of the time, but he certainly didn't go around saying this sermon brought to you by the letter Q. No, Jesus was tough. Don't buy into the wimpified cultural view of Jesus. Read the New Testament documents for yourself. In fact, why was he killed? Well, number one, he claimed to be God. That's blasphemy to the Jews and sedition to the Romans. But also, he spoke truth to power. He went after people. He's the last person that would be wimpy or somebody who was a wallflower. He was tough. By the way, I've noticed one other thing about judging. Have you ever noticed that when you compliment somebody which is a judgment, nobody gets upset. You know, if you say to your best friend, you know I really love you, you're such a wonderful person, I wish you could be like you. You think your friend's going to go, who do you think you are? Are you judging me? You think you're worse than me? No, your friend's never going to say that. See, I've noticed that people really don't have a problem with judging. They just have a problem with judgments they don't like. In fact, if you tell somebody something that's true and they get upset with you, you just help convict them. As Augustine said, we love the truth when it enlightens us. We hate the truth when it convicts us. For you military folks in here, you always get more flack when you're over the target. If you tell somebody something that's true and they're shooting back at you, you're over the target. They don't want you to expose their evil deeds. Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light. Everyone here in this room has been exposed by somebody, someone who loves us, who tells us the truth, and we don't want to hear it. And What happens to us? We get all angry, don't we? Yeah, we don't want people making judgments that we don't want exposed. By the way, there's one question I like to ask people who are not Christians, and tomorrow night at uh, University of uh, South Carolina, where all my three sons went there, they're all Gamecocks, we're going to be at the Russell House uh, Theater down there in South Carolina doing this presentation, a little bit more detail tomorrow night than what we can do here tonight, so if you want to come, you can. But in any event, usually atheists will show up. Maybe there's some atheists here. Thank you for coming. We have a microphone set up for Q&A tomorrow night, and I normally ask atheists a question if they get to the microphone. I ask them, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And I've had atheists stand in front of the microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no! Wait. I thought you claimed to be reasonable. And I ask you if something were true, would you believe it? And you say, no. How's that reasonable? It's not. The problem isn't here. The problem's here. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because they want to be God. They want to be God of their own lives. God's inconvenient. You see, most people are not on a truth quest. You know what we're on? We're on a happiness quest. And we're just, we're just going to believe whatever we think is going to make us happy. We don't want it to be true. We're making judgments saying, I'd rather... Believe something that I think is going to make me happy rather than believe something that's true. Here's the, the problem, though. The problem is, is you can make yourself happy over the short term doing a lot of stupid, sinful things, but over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in here who's over 40 knows what I'm talking about because most of us have tried it, right? So always ask the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If they hesitate or say no, the problem is in here. The problem's here. They don't want it to be true. Now, let's just sum up this section on truth this way. Can everybody see that this claim, there is no truth, shoots itself? Can everyone see that? Okay. All the claims we just went through shoot themselves. All truth is relative. You can't know anything. You ought not judge. All those claims do the same thing. So 
There is truth. And if you say there's no truth, you're violating the law of non-contradiction. So what does this mean? It means that Christianity could be true. Of course, atheism could be true as well at this point, right? We've got to go further to see which one of these is true. This also means, by the way, that if our reasoning is good here, relativism and postmodernism are false. Why? Because they claim it's true. There's no truth. You with me? All right, so let's go to the next question. Does God exist? And by the way, as I mentioned earlier, we'll spend more time on this tomorrow night if you want to see more of what's going on. I mentioned three arguments for the existence of a theistic God. The first argument, and I know Pastor Mike has been talking about this here on Wednesday night, so we won't spend a whole ton of time on the first two of these. The first argument is from the beginning of the universe known as the cosmological argument. Now, cosmological comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. It says if the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. The second argument is the argument from design known as the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. And it says if there's design in the universe and design in you, a living thing, there must be a designer. The third argument isn't scientific like these two. It's more philosophical in nature. Yet it's the argument everyone in this room has understood since you were a very small child. And it's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says if there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no God, if there is no standard beyond humanity, then everything's just a matter of opinion. That's just your opinion against a baby torturer's opinion. Or that's just your opinion against Hitler's opinion. Well, we all know certain things aren't just a matter of opinion. We know it's really wrong to torture babies for fun. If that's the case, then there must be a standard beyond us that's goodness. And that's what we mean by God's nature. If that standard doesn't exist, everything's just a matter of opinion. Now, we'll get to that argument later. Let's start here at the cosmological argument. And by the way, you must admit that that move right there was worth coming out tonight, right? <laughs> I mean, let's take a look at that again. Did you see that? Look at how God moves up there to that first argument. That is quite impressive. Now, this argument is the argument that many say points back to the big... Now, some of you going, uh, Frank, you know, we're Christians in here. Uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. In fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good, even atheists are admitting it. Stephen Hawking, who was the top physicist in the world until he died last year, who was an atheist, put it this way. He said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, Hawking tried to come up with another explanation other than God. I think he failed. But he's admitting the data that space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing. Now, I'm not going to go through the evidence for this. Why? Pastor Mike has already gone through it. It's all in the book. And it's not even controversial. Atheists are admitting it. I just want to jump to the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. If the universe had a beginning, it seems to me it must have had a beginner. We got two options. Either... No one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, which view is more reasonable? That no one created something out of nothing, or that someone created something out of nothing? Which, what, what do you think? Someone. I was at Texas A&M. must have been eight or nine years ago. I was giving this presentation, and one atheist said, oh, I think number one is more reasonable. I said, time out. Let's look at number two first. Number two says, someone created something out of nothing. I said, that's a miracle, right? But at least you got a miracle worker. You got someone. Number one is a miracle with no miracle worker. That's clearly absurd. By the way, do you realize that everyone believes in a miracle? Atheists believe in a miracle. They believe no one created something out of nothing. They believe that. But that doesn't seem reasonable to me. There's no miracle worker. That the whole universe could come into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause? That doesn't make any sense. In fact, I said to the audience that night, I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality. And oh, by the way, the law of causality doesn't say everything has a cause. It says everything that comes to be has a cause. There has to be an uncaused first cause. Even Aristotle understood that. There has to be an unmoved mover. There has to be some being that just exists eternally or something that exists eternally. It's either the universe or something outside the universe. Anyway, I said to the audience that night at Texas A&M, I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality, 
that things don't pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. There is nobody sitting in this audience here tonight who is currently worried that as you sit here, a hippopotamus has appeared out of nothing, by nothing, in your dorm room and is currently defecating on your pillow. Right? You don't worry about that, right? You don't worry that things are going to pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. You're not worried that a raging Bengal tiger is just going to appear out of nothing, by nothing, right here in this auditorium and start devouring you, right? You're not worried about that. Yet atheists are saying that the whole universe could pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. If that's the case, why doesn't everything pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause? Why don't Teslas pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause? Or MacBook Pros could have saved me four grand if it would just pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. Or suppose you're hungry after this tonight and you want to have a pizza. Does it make sense to go home and order one, or should you just sit there, wait, and hope? <laughs> one pops into existence out of nothing, by, ne by nothing, without a cause. It seems to me the atheists have all the faith. In fact, here's a question to ask the atheist. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? In other words, if there is no God, why does anything exist? The universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. Now, by the way, if that's true, and the atheists are admitting it, whatever created space, matter, and time can't be made of space, matter, and time. In other words, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create, because in order to create something, you've got to make a choice, and only persons can make choices. Also, intelligent. Because again, you got to have a mind to make a choice to create. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. You say, well, Frank, how do you know it's the Christian God? We don't yet. We haven't done enough research. I mean, this could be Allah or some other theistic God, but it could be the Christian God, right? If we keep doing research, I think we're going to see that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,986 years ago is the same being that created the universe out of nothing. But we haven't gotten there yet. No argument gets you all the way there. All right, so that's the cosmological argument. Now let's go to the teleological argument, the design argument. And scientists have discovered in the past several decades that the universe is fine-tuned. That if you were to change any one of a number of parameters about our universe, virtually imperceptibly, there'd be no universe and there'd be no life, or one or the other. If the universe was here, it couldn't support life. And some of these are just, you change it virtually imperceptibly, nothing exists. For example, Stephen Hawking, again, the atheist, put it this way. He said, if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million, a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. You change the expansion rate, that infinitesimal amount from the very beginning, none of us are here. Now, you can't make any evolutionary argument for this. Why? Because the expansion rate did not evolve to that point. The expansion rate started there. It's one of the initial conditions of the universe. Seems to me that the same spaceless timeless intelligent being that created the universe is the same being that made the expansion rate precisely what it needed to be also the gravitational force if it were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power we wouldn't exist what's one part in 10 to the 40th power that's one part in one with 40 zeros following it you say frank i can't get my head around that number i know neither can i let me give you an illustration take a tape measure and stretch it across the entire known universe Set the gravitational force at a particular inch mark on that tape measure. I realize gravity is not measured in inches, but this is just to give you a scale idea in your mind. If the strength of gravity were different by one inch in either direction, across a scale as wide as the entire known universe, we wouldn't be here. I don't have enough faith to believe that that value just landed there by chance. And oh, by the way, Chance. Does chance cause anything? Who caused this? Chance. He was just here. No. Chance is not a cause. Chance is a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. Chance doesn't cause a thing. In fact, when scientists use the word chance, you know what they really mean? We don't know. Look, either there was intelligence that put that value there, or there wasn't. There's no other, there's no other possibility. Seems to me 
the best evidence says intelligence put that value right there. And that's not the only value. There's scores of these values. Change any one of them. We don't exist. And by the way, it's not just the heavens and the universe that appears to be designed. So are you. Let's take a look at biology for a second. Tomorrow we'll look more at the planets if you can come. We don't have time to do it now, but this is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? In fact, let's go back even further than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? <laughs> I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. <laughs> when your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your father, or your mother, I should say, unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States, 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race. And you won. <laughs> Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. <laughs> you beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. <laughs> now, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool. <laughs> but you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.2 billion letter software program we call your genome that makes you you. All those 3.2 billion letters are in the right order. Half of them are in your soldier, and the other half was in your mother's egg, which was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. You know, you have not received any more genetic information from that point till right now. Your genetic in information has just duplicated itself. In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, wait a minute, Frank, time out. You can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this. This was the subject of our first book called Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law which doesn't declare or doesn't legislate morality. The only question is whose morality will you legislate? And when people say to me, well, don't, don't impose your morality on me, I go, why not? Would that be immoral? See, because you're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying I ought not impose ought nots, and you're putting an ought not on me. Actually, the better answer is this. If somebody says, don't impose your morality on me, I say, this isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder is wrong, that theft is wrong, that abortion is wrong, that rape is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men, and the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other sexual relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This is not my morality. This is the morality. This is the one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. This is the one the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 2, the Gentiles are not of the law of the law written on their hearts. This isn't my morality. It just happens to be the morality. Now, if you have a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. You have a problem with the Creator whose nature is the ground of this morality. Take it up with Him. You may not like it. You may suppress it. You may want to go your own way, but it's the morality. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's get back to this. From this point till right now, an astonishing construction project began inside of you. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For most of you, anyway. <laughs> Some cells became uh, brain cells. Others, heart cells. Others, lung cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. 
Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. Knock it off. Are you thinking about this? Are you going, wait a minute, Frank, time out. Got to concentrate. New red blood cells. No. no, this is just happening automatically. It's as if everything is going in a direction. In fact, Aristotle recognized this in general about nature 2,400 years ago. He noticed that all of nature goes in a direction. In fact, in fact think of an acorn. Why does an acorn, if you put it in the ground and you nourish it, always become an oak tree? Why does it never become an elm tree? or a birch tree, or a seahorse. You say, because it's programmed to become an oak tree. Yeah, well, who programmed it? And by the way, is an acorn, in, is a, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground going, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree here? No. <laughs> no, but if you nourish that thing, or it's nourished, it will reliably go in the direction of becoming an oak tree. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, yet it goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. That's what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s and said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God, that all of nature is going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, it must have a director, God. In other words, God just didn't create the universe. He also sustains the universe every moment. In fact, God is to the universe what a band is to music. If the band were up here playing music, the band would be creating and sustaining the music. What would happen to the music once the band stopped playing? Music's over. Same thing is true with God. God creates the universe, and he creates you, and he sustains the universe, including all the natural processes, all the natural laws, and he sustains you. If he took his hand away, we'd all go out of existence. This is why the Apostle Paul writes things like, in him. We live and move and have our being. And Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. In other words, even if the universe didn't have a beginning, like Aristotle thought, it would still need God. Why? It would need God to keep everything going moment by moment. Now, if you want more on that argument, get the book Stealing from God. But we've got to move on to the next argument in our list here. And that is the moral argument. In fact, let's suppose you go out on a hike somewhere, way, way out in the forest, and uh, you get lost. You get turned around. Your cell phone's dead. It's getting dark. You know the direction from which you came, but you can't figure out what that direction is. All you have to get you home is a magnetic compass. So you take out your magnetic compass, and you know the magne magnetic compass is supposed to point to magnetic north. If you can figure out where north is, you can get home. But instead of your compass pointing to north, your compass, no matter which way you turn, always points to you. How helpful would that compass be? You know where you are. You're trying to figure out where north is. Well, why do we as Christians or even as non-Christians think that if the compass doesn't always point to us, in other words, if things aren't going just our way all the time, either God doesn't exist, he's evil, or he's forgotten about us. In fact, do you realize that whether or not God exists, you are not the center of the universe, and neither am I? Well, why do we think we are? And by the way, is there a moral compass? Is there a true moral compass? Do we discover the right thing to do, or do we determine the right thing to do? What do you think? Do we discover right and wrong, or do we determine right and wrong? This is the interactive portion of the program. What do we do? We, we, <laughs> we discover right and wrong, but the culture tells, oh no, you determine what's right for you. I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota a little over three years ago. I was going through all this material over several nights at a church. We had the microphone set up. Second night I was there, we had a couple of young men in their 20s get up to the microphone. They were atheists. I didn't think anything of it. You call something, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Atheists are going to show up. Great. The next night I was there, about a 50-year-old man got up to the microphone, and he had a question written on two sheets of paper. And he began to read the question. 
10 seconds into reading the question, he broke down crying. He couldn't go any further. So I walked off the platform. I actually went down to him, and he handed me the two sheets of paper, and all he said was, read it, read it. So I began to read the question as I'm walking back up to the platform. I'm trying to digest this two-page question. By the time I got back up to the platform, I realized that that man, whose name turned out to be Steve, was upset for two reasons. Reason number one. Steve had recently discovered this, that a supposed friend of his, another 50 or so year old man by the name of Tom, had been sexually abusing Steve's daughter from the time she was age four to the time she was age 14, right in his own home, under his nose, never saw it. The second reason Steve was upset was because the two young men who were there the night before were his sons who used to be Christians and they're now atheists because they said if there is a good God, he wouldn't have allowed this evil to happen to our sister. There is no God. In fact, one of them was going to a Roman Catholic seminary to become a priest. As soon as he heard the news, he walked out of the sem seminary. He said, that's it. I'm done with God. There is no God. So I said, Steve, it's okay to be mad at God temporarily. God can take it. In fact, some of the Bible writers are almost mad at God. Read some of the Psalms. Read, read Habakkuk. God, where are you? It's okay. God can take it. But I hope your sons are going to realize this is not a good argument against God. In fact, it's actually an argument for God. So I said, Steve, when the time is right, I want you to say this to your sons. If there is no God, then the man who did this to your sister wasn't really wrong. It's just your opinion. Because if there is no standard beyond humanity, then you can't say he was really wrong. Why can't you say he was really wrong? Because there's no standard. There's no true compass. I mean, where did his compass point? It pointed to him. Tom had his own compass. If there is no true compass, how can you say he's got the wrong compass? You can't. And by the way, this doesn't show that God doesn't exist. It actually shows he does. Why? Because this wouldn't be evil unless there was good. And good wouldn't exist unless God existed. Not in an objective way, anyway. In order for objective good to exist, God must exist. If he doesn't exist, nothing's ultimately good, but then nothing's ultimately evil either. In fact, C.S. Lewis, early on in his life, was an atheist. He thought there was too much injustice in the world. In other words, too much evil in the world. And then one day, he realized his argument didn't work, and he actually wrote in the book Mere Christianity this... He said, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust, but how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You, you wouldn't even know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know what evil was unless you knew what good was. And good wouldn't exist unless God existed. Why? Because evil doesn't exist on its own. Evil only exists as a lack in a good thing. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of the body, you've got a better body. If you take all the body out of the cancer, you've got nothing. In other words, evil doesn't exist on its own. It only exists as a lack and a good thing. So if you're going to say something's evil, you actually have evidence for God. In fact, you could put it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you have to have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil, but you can't have shadows without sunshine. You can't have evil without good. So if evil exists... I know this sounds counterintuitive, but if evil exists, God exists. Not because God is doing evil, because he's the standard of good by which we'd even know what evil was. Now, the man who did this, Tom, who lives in a small town outside of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, everybody there knows he's guilty, but he's not in jail. Why? Because every time the trial comes up, Jessica, the one who was abused, psychologically checks out. She can't testify against him. She wanted to marry him. She didn't know. So I said, Steve, when the right time comes, I want you to say this to your sons. If there is no God, then the man who did this to your sister will never get justice. He's not going to get justice here on earth if she doesn't testify. And he's not going to get justice in the afterlife because according to atheism, there is no afterlife. Do you really think that's the way the universe is? Do you really think there's no such thing as justice? The very reason you're upset, rightfully so, is because you know a great injustice has been done. But there can't be injustice unless there's 
justice. Something can't be not right unless something is. Something can't be immoral unless something is. You see, atheism doesn't take away the pain. Atheism just takes away the hope. There's no justice if atheism is true. And everyone in this room knows that there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong, certain things that are just and certain things that are unjust. If that's the case, then God exists. Now, you can ask yourself the question, why would God allow it to continue? That's another question. We deal with it in the book Stealing from God. What you can't say is he doesn't exist because it wouldn't even be evil unless good existed. Now, Jessica, the one who was abused, once she hit 18, decided to do something positive with this awful experience. She actually wrote a book. Here it is. Not Your Princess by Jessica Mitzel. Now, why am I telling you this? Because her father, Steve, wants as many people to know that this happens too often in American households. Adults, if a young person ever comes to you and says, Uncle Joe did this to me, do not dismiss it. Well, Uncle Joe would never do that. How do you know? These kids now got nowhere, nowhere to turn. Now, Jessica, who's now about 20 years old, started going back to church because she felt the Holy Spirit calling on her. But do you know that she's still in a treatment program as of last April anyway, last time I talked to Steve? She's still in a treatment program in San Diego at $15,000 per month. She has multiple personalities, which is very common with child sexual abuse. Now, our culture wants to tell us that sex is just physical. That's a lie. If sex is just physical, why is Jessica in a treatment program at $15,000 a month? If sex is just physical, why is it worse if somebody rapes you than if somebody just physically assaults you? Because sex is not just physical. It's emotional. It's psychological. It's spiritual. It's moral. There's so much more to sex than just the physical act. In fact, you have sex with somebody, everything changes forever. Sex is like fire. You put it in your fireplace, it's wonderful. It'll warm you. You get it anywhere else in your house, it will burn your house down. Maybe not immediately, but over the long term, it will. And everyone in here knows that. We don't want to know that, though. We want to suppress the truth because we want to have fun now, don't we? Now, there's a lot more that could be said, but we don't have time right now. The bottom line to this section is that God's nature is morality's true north. If he doesn't exist, nothing's ultimately right or wrong. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from these three arguments we just went through, the cosmological, teleological, and moral arguments, we can see there's a being that's spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent, moral, a creator who creates all things and sustains all things. This sounds like the God of the Bible, doesn't it? And we haven't even opened the Bible yet. Now, how do we know it's the God of the Bible? Well, in order to figure that out, we got to go to the next question. And that question is, are miracles possible? Because a miracle can be used as a sign from God to say, listen to this guy. He's telling, me that he's telling you the truth about God. Now, a lot of people today don't think miracles are possible. For example, they think Noah is crazy. Now, let's admit it. Noah is crazy. It's nuts, right? You can admit it. A resurrection. Everyone I know who's dead is still dead, right? Have you seen anyone resurrected from the dead? I haven't. Yet, the entire Christian worldview is based on believing in something none of us have ever seen. Why would we believe that? And for some reason, the big problem miracle in the Old Testament anyway is Jonah. Is that a whale of a tail or a tail of a whale? I mean, what's the deal with Jonah? Can you really believe in Jonah? It's crazy. What is the greatest miracle in the Bible? No, it's not the resurrection. Resurrection's easy compared to the greatest miracle. What is the greatest miracle? The greatest miracle in the Bible is... I got you a second time. Yes. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? I mean, if God can create the whole show out of nothing, can he do whatever he wants that's not logically impossible inside the universe? 
Of course. Well, here's the interesting point. The interesting point is the atheists are admitting the data for the first miracle. They don't think it was God, but there's really no other choice. So if the first verse is true, then any of these other verses are at least possible. You with me? Of course Noah's crazy unless God exists. Of course Jonah's crazy unless God exists. It's not meant to be explained naturally. It's supposed to be a miracle. Of course the resurrection's crazy unless God exists. Now, by the way, a lot of people don't believe in miracles because they've never seen one. That's not a good reason to disbelieve miracles. Why? Because you believe in a lot of things you've never seen. You believe in your mind. Have you ever seen it? You're using it right now. You believe in the laws of logic. You ever seen those? You're using them right now. You believe in justice. Have you ever seen justice? No, it's not a physical thing. You may have seen justice done, but you've never seen justice because you don't see it. It's an immaterial value. You believe in love. You ever seen love? You may have seen love done. You may have loved someone. But it's not something you see. You believe in George Washington. You ever seen him? No. But you believe he existed. Why? Because there are effects that are best explained by George Washington being the cause. Same thing is true with God. How do we know God exists? We reason from effect to cause. We know there's a creation. There's got to be a creator. We know there's a moral law written on our hearts. There must be a moral law giver. We see design in the universe. There must be a designer. In other words, we reason from effect to cause. So you believe in a lot of things you've never seen. And by the way, you shouldn't expect to see a lot of miracles, if any. Why? Because if you did, they wouldn't be miracles. If this stuff happened all the time, they wouldn't get our attention as special acts from God. I mean, imagine if people rose from the dead routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean? Nothing. You go to somebody, you go, Jesus rose, to, rose from the dead to prove he was God. And he died for your sins. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle Leroy just rose from the dead two weeks ago. You know, now i got to give the inheritance back. No. It's got to be a rare event. If it's a regular event it wouldn't get our attention. Resurrections, if they occur at all, have to be extremely rare. Otherwise, the resurrection of Christ would mean nothing. And by the way, there are things that happen every day that if they didn't happen every day, we'd call them miracles. How many people in this room have seen your own flesh and blood, your own children born? Okay. Now, when you see that, you don't go, evolution! No. <laughs> you go, this is amazing! How does this happen? We don't call it a miracle. Why? Because it happens every day. But you know there's intelligence behind that. There's a mind behind that. These things happen. And again, if they didn't happen all the time, we'd call them miracles. All right. Now, there's a lot more in the book on miracles. But the bottom line is, if Genesis 1-1 is true, every other verse is at least possible. You can't rule out anything you got to check each miracle claim out on a case-by-case -case basis. So with that being said, let's now go to the final question. Is the New Testament true? We know there's truth. We know there's God. We know there's miracles. But has any other miracle occurred, particularly the resurrection of Christ since the first one, since the creation of the universe? Because, again, if the resurrection occurred, Christianity is true. Now, I have a whole bunch of evidence for this, but again, I can't show it all to you. We have limited time. I'm going to list the evidence. They all begin with the letter E. There's eight of these, but we're only going to look at two of them because of the time factor, okay? The first E, we have early sources for this. All the New Testament writers are writing very early. We have eyewitness details throughout most of the New Testament documents or many of the New Testament documents. It's been verified to be only eyewitnesses would know this stuff. We have embarrassing stories. I'll explain that one in a minute, as well as the next one, excruciating deaths. Also, there's embedded confirmation. This one is hard to explain, so I can't explain it to you right now. Um, but that right there is the best evidence you've probably never heard of that the New Testament writers are all independently witnessing the same historical event or events. And if you want to read more about that, Google two words. You ready? Undesigned coincidences undesigned coincidences. There are books written on this that you can get for free on the internet. Check it out. 
Also, expected predictions, that deals with Old Testament prophecy. There's extra biblical writers like Josephus, Suetonius, Thallus, Phlegon. These are people that wrote in the first and second century that give us a little bit of insight as to what happened in the first century, and they agree with what the New Testament writers say in terms of the New Testament writers believe Jesus rose from the dead. And finally, there's also the explosive growth of the church out of Jerusalem, which could have easily been stopped by the Jews or the Romans. They could have stopped Christianity immediately by doing what? Going to Jesus' tomb and taking the body out. And everyone knew where the body was. It was a Jewish tomb. They didn't do that. Why? Because his body wasn't in there. It's really hard to explain how a, 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 new, a new world view claiming that a resurrection occurred came out of Jerusalem if Jesus' body is still in the tomb. Now, as I said, we don't have time to go into all this. Let's just uh, give a little bit of evidence for embarrassing stories and excruciating deaths. Let's start with embarrassing stories. Why do these tend to tell us that the New Testament writers are telling the truth? Because if there's something in the text that's embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why? Because you're not going to invent things that make yourself look bad. In fact, let me ask you guys a question in here. How many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? If you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying to make yourself look good. And it's not working. We know you're lying. All right, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? No. You don't lie to make yourself look bad. You might lie to make yourself look good. Well, the New Testament writers, this is true of the Old Testament as well, but we're just looking at the New Testament. The New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing details they never would have invented. That's why we call this the duh factor. They're not making this up. Let me just give you a few of these. Notice their leader, Peter, is called Satan by Jesus. You think they, you think they made that up? You think Mark, who wrote that down at one point, said to Peter, Hey, Pete, I'm going to make this a real interesting story. I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. What do you think Peter would have said? Have him call you Satan. Look, I'm the leader here. This is embarrassing. And then Peter says, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He denies him three times. That's embarrassing. And then at the crucifixion, all the disciples, with the exception of maybe one, run away. This is like a Monty Python movie. Run away. They all run away. And who are the brave ones? The women. The women are the brave ones. Now, who wrote the New Testament down? Men. Now, what man <laughs> is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb? Would any man in here invent that? No, if I was there, I'd make myself look good, wouldn't you? I'd write something down like this. Let's see, we marched right down there and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. What do you think? Yeah, good. Okay. John said, get out. Peter, roundhouse kicked him. Philip said, we'll be back. <laughs> and then on Sunday morning, we marched right down to the tomb. And we saw Jesus who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went and comforted the trembling women. <laughs> I would never say I was Mr. Sissy Pants why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb. And oh, by the way, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses in that culture? Forget about the fact that it's embarrassing to men. It is. But there's a whole other reason. Why would they never say that in that culture? Yes, because a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They really were as embarrassing as it was. They never would have invented this. I actually had a lady come up to me once, and she said, I, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. <laughs> I said, that is an excellent point. I had not thought of that. Because ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? <laughs> there could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, hey, hon, what? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. The nuke blew up three days ago. I've been hot for three days. Hey, what's for dinner? He's not going to tell you. I can't even believe this next verse is in the New Testament. But you guys know Matthew chapter 28 is where Jesus gives the Great Commission. You know the Great Commission where he says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. 
Notice he doesn't say make believers. He says make disciples. There's a difference, right? Well, as he's, this is the climactic point in Matthew's gospel. It says, though, right there in the text that as he's giving the great commission to the disciples, in verse 17 it says, some believed, but some doubted. He's standing right in front of them, and they're doubting it's him. It's like they're, they're there going, you see that guy over there? Yeah. That guy over there is Jesus. Oh, no, it can't be Jesus. He was just killed not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's him. It can't be. The Romans killed him. Jesus is dead. It's him. They crucified him. The spear went in his side. Blood and water came out. I'm telling you, the guy's dead. It's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? The women told me. <laughs> They're not making this up. There's even potentially embarrassing details in there about Jesus. In fact, in Mark chapter 3, it says, Jesus' own family came to seize him and take him home because they thought he was out of his mind. Now, you may have heard the scholars say, you know, the New Testament writers embellish Jesus to be God. Oh, really? Why is Mark chapter 3 in there then when his own family thinks he's nuts? That's embarrassing. His own brothers don't believe in him. That's embarrassing. Jesus is called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. You think they invented that? He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which is easy to have seen as a sexual advance. And oh, by the way, do you notice there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline? Who are they? Rahab and Tamar. Do you think Matthew and Luke, who recorded the genealogies at one point, said, you know what, I really think we should spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let's put a couple of prostitutes in there. Let's see, Rahab, Tamar. <laughs> no! In fact, there's a lot of shady people in the Messiah's bloodline. Judah, from where we get the term Jew from, not a good guy. Read about him. David. David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, I guess there's hope for the rest of us. Bathsheba's in there. In fact, one of the writers, when he gets to her in the genealogy, won't even mention her name. You know what he says when he gets to her? Uriah's wife. Ooh, that's a slam. He's telling the truth, but it's a slam. Why? Who is Uriah? Husband of David, or husband of Bathsheba, I should say, whom David had killed so he could have Bathsheba. In fact, do you know that there are five women in, named in the genealogy of the Jewish Messiah's bloodline. And out of five women, only one of them's a Jew. Rahab's not a Jew. Tamar's not a Jew. Ruth is not a Jew. Bathsheba's not a Jew. Who's the only Jew? Mary, Jewish bloodline Messiah, one Jew. You think they're making this up? What do you think would happen if the historian for one of the pharaohs said, hey, Pharaoh, I'm going to put together your genealogy. I'm going to throw some prostitutes in there, some non-Egyptians, and some really shady people. What do you think? Off with your head, right? You want the ultimate no-spin zone? Read the Bible. It's telling you warts and all the truth. They never would have invented. There's so much more we don't have time to get into. Let's do one more. Let's talk about the fact that the excruciating deaths of the apostles show them that they really believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Otherwise, why would they go to their deaths? Here's a painting of Peter being crucified upside down. In fact, think about this. As we look at this, realize that all the New Testament writers, with the exception of Luke, were all Jews. They were Jewish believers in Yahweh. They already thought they were God's chosen people. So you got to ask yourself the question, why would they invent this? In fact, think about this. Before and after the resurrection, there was a huge change. Before the resurrection, these writers of the New Testament believed in animal sacrifice. They've been slaying animals at the temple, lambs at the temple, for a thousand years. And suddenly Jesus comes along and they go, you know, we don't need to slay these lambs anymore because... These lambs are just symbols of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here he is. They do away with animal sacrifice overnight. Before they believed in the binding law of Moses. Afterwards, they say Christ's life has fulfilled the binding law of Moses. In fact, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus himself does away with the dietary laws, which is good for us because that means now we can eat bacon. Before they believed in strict monotheism. Afterwards, they believed in a trinity, three persons in one divine essence. Yes, I know the trinity is in the Old Testament, but it's much clearer in the New. In fact, we just did a, uh, a podcast a few weeks ago on the trinity in the Old Testament. It's, it's in there more than you think, actually. 
but it becomes explicit in the new. Before, they believed in the Sabbath. In fact, they thought they could be stoned for not obeying the Sabbath. Afterwards, they're worshiping on Sunday. And Paul even writes in Colossians chapter 2, don't let anyone tell you you have to obey any Sabbath or festival day. Why? What did the Sabbath represent? It represented rest. Who's our rest? Jesus is our rest. Once Jesus shows up, the symbol is no longer necessary. He's here. In fact, out of the Ten Commandments, Nine of them are repeated in the New Testament. The only one that isn't, keep holy the Sabbath. Before they believed in the conquering Messiah, afterwards a sacrificial Messiah. Before they believed in circumcision, afterwards they believed in baptism and communion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what would cause these pious Jews who thought they were God's chosen people for over a thousand years, what would cause them to abandon everything on the left and adopt everything on the right virtually overnight, and then go die for it. The only thing I can think of is what psychologists call an impact event. What's an impact event? An impact event is an event that occurs in your life that is so impactful, so dramatic, that it can change your perspective 180 degrees overnight. Some impact events are so dramatic, while you might not remember what you had for breakfast this morning, you'll remember an impact event that happened 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago if you're old enough. In fact, there's only a few of you in this room that are going to be able to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you can remember where you were and what you were doing November 22nd, 1963, raise your hand and hold it up. Hold it up high. Hold it up high. Ladies and gentlemen, you see these people with their hands up? These people are very old. <laughs> November 22nd, 1963 is my earliest memory. I was two years old in two days. Yes, yes, I know. I'm 57 years old. No, I know, I know. I don't look a day over 56. In fact, when I hit 50, my wife was very encouraging. She said, honey, you're going to live to be 100. I said, how do you know? She said, because you look half dead already. <laughs> anyway, I'm two years old in two days. I'm a toddler. I'm standing in our home in one of Massa, New Jersey, and my mother is sitting on an ottoman in front of a black and white TV, weeping uncontrollably. Mommy, what's the matter? What's the matter? They killed the president. They killed the president. President Kennedy assassinated that day. I can still see my mother in my mind right now, sitting there, crying, when she was 26 years old. As if she were sitting there right now. She's 81 today. But I can see her when she was 26. That's an impact event. That's my earliest memory. I don't remember anything before that and very little after that. <laughs> Where were you when the second plane hit the tower? I was in my home office up in Charlotte, and I had the TV on behind me. I had seen the first tower had been hit by something. I didn't know by what. And I was talking to a pastor on the phone. He was on the north side of Charlotte, and we were trying to figure out what the topic would be that I was going to come to his church and speak. And we were just talking. I said, you got the TV on? He goes, yeah. I said, maybe a Cessna hit the World Trade Tower. And we're talking, and suddenly he goes, he screams into the phone. He goes, the second tower just got hit. I turned around. I look at the TV. The second tower is on fire. I said, was it a Cessna? He goes, no, no, no. It was a, it was a passenger plane. It looked like a United plane. I said, you saw that? He goes, it was just on live TV. It flew in there and exploded. I said, look, look, let me call you back. I hung up the phone. And for some reason that morning, I had CNN on, the Communist News Network, and I'm not making this up, but the commentator on CNN said this. One has to think there's some sort of navigational error here. I said, you dimwit. This is the clearest day in the history of the Big Apple. What do you think, pilots can't see where they're going? You think Stevie Wonder's flying these planes? I mean, come on. This is terrorism. I called that pastor the next day. I said, we're going to come to your church and talk about Islam because that's what this is related to. Now, 9-11 is over 17 years ago. But those of you in this room who are old enough can remember something about that day. But if I were to ask you where you were 17 days ago, most of you are going to go, I don't know, look at my iPhone. What was I doing that day? I don't know. <laughs> Why can you remember something from 17 days ago but not 17 years? or 17 years ago, but not 17 days ago. No impact events 17 days ago. Impact events 17 years ago. Do you think if Jesus of Nazareth really walked out of that tomb after being dead since Friday, 
And then he did miracles for the next 40 days. Do you think that would have been an impact event? Do you think the disciples would have remembered everything Jesus said and did for the rest of their lives if that really happened? Yeah. And that's the only way I can figure out whether I would have abandoned everything on the left and adopted everything on the right virtually overnight. In fact, if you think about this, what did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? What did these Jews get by saying Jesus had risen from the dead? Well, they got kicked out of the synagogue, and then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, there was not a list of perks. Hey, we're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah. What's it going to get us? Well, first we'll get kicked out of the synagogue, and then we'll get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up. <laughs> Gee, what a great idea. Why haven't we thought of this earlier? In fact, they have every, every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did. In fact, sometimes you know, people will say, hey, are there any non-Christian writers who talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yeah, there are. They're all in chapter 9 of the book. But you know what is sometimes underneath that question is an illicit assumption. You know what the assumption is? Well, you really can't trust the New Testament writers because, you see, these, these were religious people. We know that religious people embellish things. They make it up. You really need to look at the secular writers to figure out what happened. If you think about that for more than 10 seconds, you realize how stupid that objection is. Why? Because what motive did these people have to make this up? No, they already thought they're God's chosen people. Why are they inventing this? They're not. In fact, why would they die for a known lie? You say, wait a minute, time out, Frank. You just got talking about Islam. There are some Muslims that will die for their faith. If you're going to say that martyrdom proves Christianity, don't you have to say that martyrdom proves Islam? No, why? Because there are huge differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament Martyrs of New Testament times. Let me just give you one major difference for our purposes here. The Muslim martyrs today haven't witnessed anything. They haven't witnessed a miracle. They don't have the evidence that Islam is true. They just have faith. But the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times witnessed Jesus rise from the dead. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. Some people will die for a lie they think is the truth. Nobody will die for a no, when, when they know it's a lie. And the New Testament martyrs were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. You can't get better evidence than that unless you were there yourself. Now, last thing I'm going to say before we wrap this up, and if for those of you that believe, as I do, that the Bible is true and inerrant, this is going to sound like heresy, but it's not. Stick with me. Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under, under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. How? What do you mean? Because Christianity is not based on a book. Christianity is based on an event. The resurrection. Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Frank, how could you be a Christian without the book of Romans? Was Paul a Christian before he wrote the book of Romans? Of course he was. Why did he write it? Because he witnessed a resurrected Christ. Was John a Christian before he wrote the gospel of John and the other books? Yes. Why? Because he witnessed a resurrected Christ. Was Matthew a Christian? You get the idea. In other words, the resurrection gave us the book. The book didn't give us the resurrection. You wouldn't even have a New Testament written by Jews in the first century if there wasn't a resurrection. Why are they making this up? They're not. In fact, you could put it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. You wouldn't even have this book or series of books unless the resurrection had occurred. Are you with me on this? Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? In other words, if you're a Christian and you're trying to talk to a non-Christian, don't say the reason Christianity is true is because the Bible's inerrant. That's stupid. You don't start there, you end there. He doesn't believe the Bible's inerrant, so why would you tell him it is? You've got to give him evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, then everything follows from it. Because if he rose from the dead, he's God. And if he's God, whatever he teaches is true. And if he taught the Old Testament is the word of God, then it is. Mark it down. Look, I just have a personal policy. If somebody rises from the dead, I just believe whatever the guy says. Okay? So show them that the resurrection occurred, and you don't need inerrant documents for that. You just need reliable evidence. 
All right, now, we could spend more time. We don't have the time. Let's, let's sum this whole thing up. Does truth exist? The answer is, if somebody says there's no truth, what are you going to say? Is that true? Does God exist? Yeah, we talked about three arguments, cosmological, teleological, and moral, which gives us a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who created and sustains all things. Are miracles possible? Yeah, the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, which is what? Yes, Genesis 1-1, the creation of the universe out of nothing. And we just gave some evidence that the New Testament's true. So if you want to go further, tomorrow night we'll have more time. We'll go into more of this if you can come to uh, Gamecock land down there in downtown Columbia. It starts at 7. If you can't be there, you can watch it. We're streaming live on our Facebook page. I'll tell you about that in a minute, actually. The books and the DVDs are over there. Text the word evidence to 44222. 44222. Also, we're now teaching online courses. The top scholar in the world on the resurrection, Gary Habermas, who's writing a magnum opus right now that's approaching 5,000 pages is going to be your instructor. It starts next week, but you got to sign up soon. You're going to be live on Zoom video with Gary Habermas. You're going to ask him any question you want, the top guy in the world on the resurrection, but you got to sign up soon because Monday it starts and we're running out of room. We, we only have so many seats in there because we want people to have enough ability to interact with Gary. There's other courses up there that you can take as well, including I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, Stealing from God, some other courses. So check that out off our website, crossexamine.org. Uh, we're also on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. In fact, uh, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've actually combined these three into one social media platform. It's called You Twit Face. <laughs> it's kind of a Jersey thing. So sign up for You Twit Face. We're on radio Saturdays. We're on DirecTV on Wednesday nights, as I mentioned. And then uh, if you don't do anything else, download the free cross examined app. Two words in the app store, cross examine It's got the TV show streaming. It's got the podcast on there. It even has a quick answer section where you can get a quick answer to somebody who says something uh, to you, say, over lunch. If you've got your phone, you can get an answer to it right then and there. So about uh, over 180,000 people have downloaded it, so they're finding it helpful, okay? All right, last thing. You know what this, all this means? If all this is true, it means somebody actually did die for you. The very creator who created you added fleshed over his deity, came to earth, and allowed the people to, who rebelled against him to torture him, so you wouldn't have to take the punishment. I wouldn't have to take the punishment. He took it on himself. Now, I was in the Navy many years ago, and I was in naval aviation, and uh, in aviation, you earn golden wings, which are hard to earn, but it's nothing like earning a golden trident, which is what the SEALs earn. You see that very few people who go through SEAL training actually graduate, 5, 10, 15 percent tops, right? Those that do graduate wear that trident with pride. It's literally their identity. Because you're a stud if you're a seal, and you're wearing in the trident. Well, when Michael Monsor was buried in California, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast, West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they passed his casket, they took off their tridents and pressed them into his casket. In other words, they took their identity and put their identity into their Savior, the one that sacrificed himself for them. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take our identity and put it in our Savior because that's where our identity is. You don't achieve your identity. You receive your identity. I was just at a jail uh, speaking on Friday in Ohio. I was speaking to about 25 guys who were in solitary confinement. Most of them in there for murder. They can have the same identity that you and I can. Why? Why? Because we get our righteousness from Christ. We don't get it from what we do or not do. But you know, our culture is going to tell you to put your identity in anything other than your Savior. Put your identity in your political party. Put your identity in your race. By the way, there's only one race, the human race. Put your identity in your ethnic group. Put your identity in your sexual preference. Put your identity in your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Put your identity in your bank account or your vocation. None of those things are ultimate. None of those things are going to make you content. You were meant to know God and to make him known. Your identity is in your Savior already, whether you know it or not. 
Now, if you don't want to accept that, that's fine. You don't have to. God will not force you into heaven against your will. If you don't want him now, you're not going to want him in eternity. So our identity is in, your, in our Savior who died for us, but he didn't just die. He also rose again to prove he was God. Now, we've just got about three or four minutes. Does anyone have a quick question? Because we have to go at 8.30. And if you want more of this, as I say, tomorrow night we'll have more time. But question? Anybody? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Just yell it out. Louder, if you would. Go ahead. Stand up. Louder, if you would. Okay, the question is about the Quran. What kind of evidence do we have for the Quran? Here's a real short answer. The Quran, inside the Quran, Muhammad never claims to do miracles. He only claims to be a plain warner. In other words, he's warning people there's one God. Miracles are only attributed to Muhammad 150 or so years after his death, not in the Quran, but in the written traditions of what Muhammad supposedly said and did. And even many Muslim scholars agree that most of those miracles didn't occur, that they're legendary. Um, the problem for Muslims is they're trying to say that the Quran is authoritative on what happened to Jesus. But the Quran was written in the 600s AD. We have documents written by people who were there that we put into the New Testament, eyewitnesses who tell us that Jesus died and rose from the dead. The Quran comes along 600 years later and says he didn't even die, so he couldn't have risen from the dead. Even atheistic scholars like Bart Ehrman from UNC Chapel Hill admits that almost every scholar agrees Jesus at least was crucified. The Quran doesn't even say he was crucified, okay? Why would we take a document written 600 years later to tell us what happened to Jesus 600 years before when we have people who were there telling us what happened? So the Quran doesn't carry any water in my mind with regard to telling us what happened to Jesus. Now, the Quran might have truth in it, don't get me wrong, but when it comes to what happened to Jesus, I think the Quran has it wrong. All right, now that's a real short answer to a real long question, okay? There's a lot more you can learn about. If you want to learn more about Islam, there's a friend of mine online, his name is David Wood. Look him up, David Wood, and he's got a YouTube channel that goes through all this. I think his YouTube channel is called Acts 17, Acts 17. Anybody else? Time for one more question. Mm, yes, sir, go ahead. Okay, there, the question is, his friends or his family is saying, well, the Bible was written 300 years later by people who are trying to control the masses. When somebody says that or someone says anything, it's not your job to refute what they say. It's their job to support what they say. So the first question, I'm going to give you three questions. These questions you can use for anything, but especially these kinds of matters. The first question I would ask that person, what do you mean by that? What do you mean it was written 300 years later? Because even atheists will admit it wasn't written 300 years later, okay? Okay. The second question is, what evidence do you have for that position? Or how did you come to that conclusion? I can tell you that 99 times out of 10, as we say in Mississippi, <laughs> that when you ask that question to somebody who says something like that, they're not going to have an answer. Why? Because they don't have evidence. They just have a slogan, right? They've heard this slogan. They think it's true. And as soon as you ask them for evidence, they don't have any evidence because they haven't researched it. The third question is an opportunity for you to provide evidence back. After you say, what do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? You ask, have you ever considered that the Bible writers of the New Testament did not write 300 years later? They were written in the first century, as even many atheistic scholars admit. Okay, And I can give you evidence to show that. All right, And then you can see where it goes from there. Now, those three questions, what do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? Have you ever considered our questions from my friend Greg Kokel's book, Tactics, which is a great book to get if you want to be able to navigate conversations on this issue, okay, or any of these issues. And those questions are also in our app. 
Now, by the way, let me point out one other thing. Last thing I'll say before Pastor Mike's going to pray for us. These questions you can use for anything, not just questions about Christianity. What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? Have you ever considered? Parents, use this with your kids. You know, you get a call one night from your son. Dad, I'm not going to be home by 11 like you wanted me to. No panic. Just say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Second question, how did you come to that conclusion? Third question, have you ever considered if you're not home by 11, you're grounded for two weeks? Be right home, Dad. <laughs> by the way, by the way, husbands, 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 never, ever, ever use these questions with your wife, <laughs> right? Because if she calls you an idiot, don't say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> How'd you come to that conclusion? Because she's going to have a list 25 years long, and you are going to be toast, <laughs> all right? I hope to see you guys tomorrow night, but Pastor Mike, why don't you close us out, brother? Real quick, are you doing a conference in Charlotte this fall? I know you... Yeah, there's a conference that our seminary puts on uh, in October. I think it's like October 11th or sometime. Um, Who's coming there, up. typically? I know you have the same speakers. Oh, yeah, well, you know, there's guys like Robbie Zacharias. I don't know if he'll be there this year, but Josh McDowell... Norman Geisler, uh, Jay Warner Wallace, you may have heard Jim Wallace, just a lot of speakers there. And it's every October, second weekend in October in Charlotte, right up the road at the big Calvary Church, the big pink church, we call it the Mary Kay Cathedral. And uh, so you guys can come to that. It's a great two days of like, this kind of evidence. So All right? we'll present that to you in the fall, give you information, and maybe we could caravan up there. Don't forget, before you leave, we have dessert, we have ice cream. Uh, avail yourself to that. Some fellowship. Frank's got his uh, stand over there with the books. If you want to get a copy, get it signed, feel free to do so. Thanks for coming tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the evidence that was presented tonight in a nutshell. And Father, all of this is more than just information. It's to drive us to reach the lost. And I pray that, Father, all of us would leave here not just enlightened, but we would go out with a desire to share our faith and to give a ready defense for the hope that we have. May it create a greater passion in our hearts to see people cross that line of faith. Thank you, Lord, for raising up men and women in the body of Christ who teach us to defend the faith. Bless us now as we go, in Jesus' name, amen.